get time to just share the word of the Lord together. I am so excited to share this message with you today. I'll try and keep it very, very short, very, very brief. And then I believe that we are going to have an amazing time in the presence of the Lord and you're going to be blessed in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Um, on Tuesday, I don't remember what we were talking about on Tuesday, but I hope you guys are blessed by the message on Tuesday. And uh, if you did not catch that message, you can go back and watch it. And I'm sure that you are going to be blessed. Um, I would like to talk about uh, something very, very elementary. There are two things that the Holy Spirit has been putting in my heart. The emphasis and the need for us to speak about, for us to talk about. And um, probably, let me see if I will be able to touch on both of them today. And I believe that we are going to be blessed together. Amen. If you're a team live chat, just go ahead and put a fire emoji. Tonight we are actually live and so it's interesting and it's new for us to be live together with you this evening in the presence of the Lord. Amen. I want to talk about baptism and I want to talk about the Holy Spirit uh, and the speaking of speaking in tongues. Um, Acts chapter 2 verse 38 to 41 the Bible says and Peter said to them repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself and with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them saying save yourselves from this crooked generation so those who received his word were baptized and they were added to the day about 3000 they were added um, they were there were added that day about 3000 souls to the kingdom of god now this is right after the disciples were filled with the holy spirit and i want you to remember the character of peter is that peter was the one who was scared when he was confronted by a little girl to speak up and to say that he had been with jesus he's the one who said who denied him and said me i've never seen that man but yet in this instant after the holy spirit came upon him we see the same peter standing up against more than three thousand people who came and were accusing them of being drunk in the morning my god when they needed someone to step up peter is the one who stepped up and said i i know this is this is not what you guys think we are not drunk we are not drunk with wine there is something better that we have received and you too can receive this gift and after preaching this sermon the bible says that three thousand souls came to jesus in that day 3,000 souls were added to their number. And so this gives us a clear understanding of what spirit we have received. Oh, the Bible says that we have received the spirit, not of timidity, but we have received the spirit of love, of boldness, and of a sound mind. This is the spirit that we have received. When you receive the Holy Spirit, there is something that changes in your life. The thing that changes in your life is that you become a new man. How do you become a new man? The man of the flesh is put to death by the coming to life of the man of the spirit. Because each and every one of us, you must understand that man is trapezoid, just like God is, and there is your flesh which is connected to the world, which is by nature leaning towards the fallen nature of man. But when you receive Jesus, there is a new creature, there is a new man that comes to life. This new man does not identify with what your flesh man identified with this new man identifies with god identifies with the nature of christ identifies with a resurrected christ my god it is a new nature now that comes to life there is another man that comes to life the one that was scared is gone the new man has come that is bold that can be able to speak up uh, in front of three thousand people the old man who did not have faith is gone the new man has come who believes in god the old man who had the DNA of their grandfather, their great grandfather, and who was dealing with generational curses is gone. A new man has come who is living according to the promises and the lineage of Abraham. My God, that the newness of the man that has come is that now you have two people who are living inside your the same body that you have. Now, this is what I mean. The body was supposed to house your spirit. It is not the other way around. The body was made for the spirit man because your spirit existed before your flesh existed. This is why Jesus says to our Jeremiah that God says to Jeremiah, before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you and I chose you. 
So it means that there is a place where we interacted with God in spirit before we came to the earthly body. And the reason why we feel void and we feel like something is missing until we are connected back to God is because there is a relationship we once had with him that was disconnected by us coming into the flesh. When we restore that relationship, we have just found life. My God. Hallelujah. So your spirit man existed first and your spirit man will live on. But the flesh man is the one that houses the spirit but wants to be the man of the house. And so your flesh must be put into subjection by your spirit man. Meaning that the spirit man should be the one that takes control over your life because you're a spiritual being. You're a spiritual being. But if you're not aware of who you are in the spirit, because any person who has not received Jesus, any person who has not received the spirit of God, remember, the spirit of God is the word ruach, okay? The breath of life. It is uh, in my book, What God Says About Your Identity, uh, there's a place where I wrote and I said that the, how to understand the spirit is like what a battery is to a portable radio. You can have that portable radio, walk around with it, but that portable radio has everything that it needs to function. But without the batteries, the, the, the radio cannot go on. But the spirit man, when the spirit of God comes inside your spirit man, it powers your spirit man. Okay? Now your spirit man has life. Your spirit man now finds expression. But before the spirit of God comes in, your spirit man is dead. Okay? So this is what Paul refers that to who are dead in their transgression. Because there is a way that you can live a life, you're just alive, but your spirit man is dead. But when your spirit man comes to life, your spirit man will now quicken your mortal body. Are, are you seeing that? That the spirit man now begins to control even how the flesh will function. And a person of the spirit, my God help me. A person who is filled with the Holy Spirit, a man who walks by the Spirit, you can tell by even how their flesh is regenerated over time. A man who is living in the flesh, you can tell by how their flesh deteriorates over time. Because it is leading towards death. So the same Spirit that uh, the disciples, the Bible says that when Peter, the one who was filled by this spirit, when he was filled, he ministered and preached the gospel. And he told them, come now and I want you to be baptized in the name of Jesus. Okay. So now there's a question now. Because Jesus said to the disciples, he said to them, go, go ye and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that, you understand, teaching them to obey, to, to obey everything that you have been taught. Okay? So this was the instruction to go. So all of us are given that charge to go. All of us, we are given that charge to go. Where? To all nations. To do what? To preach the gospel of Jesus. And then what? To baptize men in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay? And to teach them to observe the things that we have been taught. This is the instruction that Jesus gave. But when the disciples went out, they didn't baptize people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They baptized people in the name of Jesus Christ. Okay. So the question, even those who are baptized, even those who are baptized by John the Baptist, they had to be baptized again. Did you get that? They had to be baptized again. The ones who were baptized by John the Baptist. Because the baptism of John the Baptist was in whose name? But the baptism of John the Baptist was in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, so this is why the dilemma he had. Now Jesus is here. One of, of the three in whose name I was baptizing people. So he was baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So now what was it supposed to be when he's baptizing Jesus? In the name of you, your daddy, and your spirit. You understand? So when he, they gave that, when he gave the, that instruction to the disciples, check it. Everywhere they went, they didn't baptize people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Because they understood that the name that captures the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is one name. That name is Jesus Christ. 
And so they went out baptizing people in the name of Jesus Christ. Why in the name of Jesus Christ? Because the baptism that we are entering into is we are being, we are dying together with him and we are raising together with him. We are not dying together with the Father. We are not dying together with the Spirit because remember the Spirit is the one that came to quicken Jesus and to bring him back to life. So truly who died? It is Jesus who died. Who rose? It is Jesus who rose. Who died for our sins? Who did we die together with? We died together with Jesus. And who did we rise together with? We rose together with Jesus. And so there are people who who say and think that it is an error for you to baptize people in the name of Jesus Christ as opposed to the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But in reality, what the disciples did and what they baptized people was is in the name of Jesus. Because the meaning of baptism is death and resurrection. And the Father is not dying. The Father is not resurrecting. The Spirit is not dying. The Spirit is not resurrecting. There is only one who died. And there is only one who rose. And there is only one who was given a name which is above every other name. That name Jesus is more powerful than Father. The name Jesus is more powerful than the name Father. Because when the father sees the son, he's he's stopped by the... Are you getting me? Do you know, the Bible says that whatever you ask in my name shall be done for you. It means that whatever you ask in the name of Jesus, God has to obey. Who is God obeying? God is obeying a name, the name. The father now is obeying the name of the son. You see, God is not a father. I want you to understand that. The the, the, the term father is just an expression that God, that Jesus used and that God used as an expression for us to know uh, because of what of, it's like a metaphor for us to be able to understand. My God, I, I don't know. I can't now come and tell my children that I am the head, that I am this, that I am this, is they know me as their daddy. When I walk into in, into this house, they know me as their daddy. It will be difficult for me to explain myself to them who I am outside the context of how they know me as. Okay? When I go to the marketplace, there are people who know me as a businessman. When I go to the legal field, there are people who know me as a lawyer. When I come to ministry, there are people who know me as a powerful minister. But when I come to my house, my children know me as daddy. Does that mean that all I am is daddy? Are you getting me? So we call God the father. We call God father because that is how he has designed for us to know how to relate with him as daddy. But that doesn't stop him from being everything else that he is that we have no idea of. Are you getting this? Hallelujah. Now understand that Jesus was essentially God. One essence, and I've taught you before this before, that is the same concept of water. The chemical formula of water is H2O. The chemical formula of ice is H2O. The chemical formula of water vapor is H2O. They are the same in essence, but different in expression. Okay? So if you take the solid water, the ice, and you put it on top of the table, someone will argue and say, that is ice, it's not water. We don't dispute. But what is the essence? The essence is water. If you put it in a glass and you leave it at a certain temperature, it will turn to to water. And if you boil it and if you burn it to a certain temperature, it will turn to water vapor. But at the end of the day, you don't disintegrate water. (laughs) It will just change in expression depending on how you need to use it functionality. So now God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, they are all one. The difference is the expression. For what purpose? Functionality. Okay? So when we baptize people in the name of Jesus, we are baptizing them in the name of the one whose functionality. Functionality. The functionality of God that gave us salvation. So we are baptized in the name that is above every other name. God responds to that name. He's bound by that name. If, 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 if Minister Baraka, uh, for example, thank you for watching the noise behind the camera. If Minister Baraka uh, comes and tells you guys something in church and says, okay, guys, we need to change the seats. Instead of facing forward, we need to have them face to the side. Some of you would actually turn the chairs. Okay? But if I come and say, now, 
you have to turn those seats and for them to look in front. I don't even need to come there. Somebody else can come and say, guys, Apostola Mesema, Viti Ziangali Embele. What are you going to do? You're going to turn the seats to look in front. For what purpose? Because a name that is higher than Minister Baraka's name in the, in the context of the ministry has spoken. Nikama took you a high school, from one at Ninja from four, Menezampiga. But from one and I think you from four and be a Then, then, mtake kumpiga but I am the principal I mean say mnyamaze. Everyone will be quiet. Why? Because he does. He has not come in his own name. He has come in the name of the principal of the school. Are you getting? So in the same way, situations respond and respect you. They they have to respond not because they fear you, but because of the name that you come by. That's why people receive their healing because you don't come by your own name. You came in you come in another name that is higher than your own name. Are you guys learning this? I wanted to keep this very short. You you came in another name. You came in another name. So baptism is in the name of Jesus. I hope you understand that. Our baptism is in the name of Jesus. Oh, because we are dead, we died together with him and we rose together with him. When you're going down, the man of the flesh goes down with all his sins, all his issues, all his struggles, everything goes down. When you come out of that water, a new man comes out. A new man comes out. A new man comes out. And I don't know where we removed baptism from our teaching. Because the Bible says, as soon as someone believed, as soon as they believed, that day they had 3,000 baptisms. Can you explain to me how 120 people were able to baptize 3,000 people? Are you getting me? Did they, did they wait for Peter to be the one who is baptizing 3,000 people? The answer is certainly not. Because the Bible says that in that day, 3,000 were added to their number. Meaning that on the same day, 3,000 people were baptized. Okay. So how did they do it? The only way, the only explanation is you baptize your people. Then after you've been baptized, you turn, you take somebody else, you baptize them. Then like that, the another one, you baptize them. Then all of you, 3,000 people are baptized in the same day. How do you baptize 3,000 people as 120 people? It's too much. It's too much work. If you, even if you do the math, it's one to a hundred or something like that. Imagine. One to I actually I think like thirty or three hundred or something. I'm, I'm not sure. Three thousand people. Anyway, they baptize it. But, but the, 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 the truth is that all of us are called to go and baptize. Baptism is not just for pastors. It's not for I mean the baptism on our post. No, 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 no. Anyone could have done it. Any believer could have done it. Any believer could have done it. Now, baptism is very, very important in our faith. Why? Because baptism, number one, we get baptized because it is an obedience to our faith. Yes? If you, you are born again, yes, and many of us are born again, and uh, for years we come to church, but we have never been baptized. And if you ask them, why have you never been baptized? I've never had the opportunity. Or you, you rose so high in ministry that now you became shy of telling people that I've never been baptized, guys. Right? So for that reason, you, 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 you hold back and you never let people know that you're not baptized. But baptism should be, all of us should be baptized. And it is not supposed to be done after you, when you receive Jesus, then we take you through discipleship. No, no, no. It's as soon as you believe, as you receive Jesus. As soon as you receive Jesus, you are baptized as a symbol of your salvation. Hallelujah. It is part of us, as the sacraments that we have of our faith. It is we have the Holy Communion and we have baptism. You're taken into the water. When you, when you stand in that water, there's something that it does. Number two, baptism is what marriage is to a bride. Uh, baptism is what a wedding is to a bride. Okay? The man will say, I see we are married. See, 22 age to Fanyiki to Ah, but the woman, no. I had it since I was I was waiting for this to happen. I even had how my I even designed my dress. I saw where you'd be standing. I saw the shoes that I would be wearing. This thing is happening. We are walking down the aisle because it's something that they have been waiting for. What is the importance of a wedding to a marriage? Is it essential? Yes, it is. Why? Because it becomes a place where you show witness to 
what the covenant that you have made. You are actually inviting people to become witnesses to the covenant that you have made with God. And so the same way when you are being baptized, you need to invite your friends who are not even born again. Invite your friends that you used to go to the club with. Invite your aunties. Invite your cousins. Invite your uncles. Invite everyone you know who is around your life. Why? Because you want them to be a witness of the day. This is an important day because on this day, you, you, your old life is gone and the new man has come forth. And it is important for them to witness because now they will know places they can't call you. They will know meetings they can't have with you. They will know expectations not to place on you because of the person that you have become. Hallelujah. Yeah, it's a very important thing. So you invite them, let them come and see that you have made a decision to follow Christ. And that is also important because then they will hold you accountable. Because when you try to do certain things, ah, didn't you get baptized? What happened? So somehow it gives you a sense of responsibility. But if you just got married, nobody knows where you got married. You were just you just took somebody's son and you started living together. Nobody knows where you went. Everyone thinks you went. Your parents knew you were going for water. You didn't come back. So now, after a year or two years, who is to hold you accountable or hold you to the standard of marriage when nobody knows if you're, if you're married? Are you getting that? So it's also very important for us because of the aspect of witnesses witnessing now number three which is the most important reason is what it symbolizes death and resurrection together with christ now baptism is not by sprinkling by the pouring of water on your head and baptism is not when you are a child when you don't have understanding baptism biblical baptism is done when a person makes a voluntary choice to follow jesus you choose personal i choose to follow christ when you make that choice and when you understand what it is that you have that is happening that you have made a decision to follow christ for the rest of your life then you're put in the water okay right it's very important it is it is not sprinkling it is baptism that that word has never been changed from the original word the original word is baptism which means to fully emerge something in water it was not changed for a specific reason so that we don't go and change it and mean many other things okay so it is when you are submerged under the water and you are removed out of the water this is what baptism means hallelujah now what is the connection baptism once you've been baptized then what follows that is that the bible says that you will be filled by the holy spirit you will be filled most of the most of, you can be filled by the holy spirit before you're baptized but most of them, most of the people who were baptized, the Bible says that they were baptized and then by the laying on of their hands by the apostles, they received the gift of the Holy Spirit. So the gift of the Holy Spirit is also is something that you desire. The gift of the Holy Spirit, you ask, you wait, you pray until the Lord himself gives it to you. And it is something that you receive. And you will know you have received the Holy Spirit when he comes, when you receive him. My God. Yeah. You will know. How will you know that you have received the Holy Spirit? Something in you will begin to change. The Bible says that after Jesus gave the instruction of uh, going to baptize people, he says, and these signs shall follow them that do believe. These signs shall follow them that do believe. What signs? They shall cast out demons. They shall speak in other tongues. They shall Take deadly poison and it will not harm them. These were signs that would follow believers. And you hear people preaching and speaking against the speaking of tongues. You hear people actually speaking about not speaking in tongues. When tongues, it's Jesus himself who said that these signs shall follow them that do believe. They shall speak in other tongues. Question. Why is Jesus telling us that these signs shall follow them that do believe? They shall speak in other tongues. They shall cast out demons. They shall eat deadly poison and it will not harm them. Okay. Who other people do we know who operated in these dimensions? Number one, we know that Jesus cast out demons. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we don't know whether he ate deadly poison, but we know he casted out demons. So it follows that Jesus would also speak in other tongues. So we understand how it is possible for him on the Mount of Transfiguration to pray for hours and come back and tell the others, you guys, you can't even pray for one hour. You know, like he put it like one hour is the minimum. Like you can't even pray for just one hour. 
Come pray for one hour. For one hour. Hallelujah. Okay. Now, remember Paul? He was beaten by a snake, shook it off, and then he just moved on with life. He didn't harm him. Paul is the one who said that uh, he's the one who shakes off this, the, the, the serpent and it falls off. Now, hear me. The people who speak against the, the, the speaking in tongues, most of the time, number one is people who don't speak in tongues. Most of the time. Okay? And the scripture that they use to quote this is the scripture where Paul spoke. And Paul spoke about many things. And I, I say this very, uh, very carefully, that there are certain things that Paul spoke that were addressing issues in particular churches that does not apply in different circumstances. One of them is when he spoke about the speaking in tongues in a church. Because there's a difference between speaking in, church, in, in tongues, praying in tongues. Okay? There is a difference between speaking in tongues and praying praying in tongues or praying in the spirit these are different dimensions okay all right um paul was speaking to this church because they had the habit of coming to church and all that would happen was people would just be speaking in tongues not praying in tongues but speaking in tongues and the other one responds rakushka balianta baru falima and the other one talks, oh, good on, you, know, oh, sadi, daddy. you can imagine. So now, Paul was talking to this particular church because, yes, you've received the gift, but now don't abuse it because there are people who have come into the church who do not understand what is happening. If you're going to have, uh, if you're going to speak in tongues, have an interpreter to speak, okay? To interpret what you are speaking. And this, we have witnessed even in Brain City when the Holy Spirit speaks, and then there's some uh, at times when, an interpreter would interpret what the Holy Spirit is speaking. Okay, this happened in our dream team uh, camp. We went, we went for a camp uh, one time, and during the camp, as we were praying in tongues, uh, someone was speaking in tongues, and another person was interpreting the tongues, and they were so accurate afterwards. Like, we're like, is that yeah, 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 something like that? You understand? So it's a gift that God gives. Now he was speaking against speaking in tongues because now what he was writing to bring to the church was to bring order order okay because you had women who because of ministry would not now submit to their husbands because they are ministering in the church and they were bringing a lot of chaos and confusion in the church to the point that paul said let no let women not preach was this the intention of god no it is just addressing an issue in a particular place and in a particular church hear me because paul himself says that i pray in tongues more than all of you. So how can he be against what he himself is using as an advantage? Are you getting that? So he is not saying, do not, what he's saying is for the sake of order in church, don't speak in tongues in, in that you're speaking to us. We don't understand you. But if you are praying in tongues, it is okay. You can pray in tongues. That one is not addressed. That one is, is okay. The scripture also says he who prays in tongues edifies himself. So what tongues does is that it edifies, it strengthens the believer. Then another Bible says that whoever prays in spirit prays for the body of Christ. Okay, so you pray for the church. You pray for people in different places. So that's why you can find yourself sometimes you're praying in tongues and you are praying for people in China. And you are evading something in China that is happening. Now, how does this happen? These are levels of prayer when you're praying. Okay. All right. Now, I want, you, I want you to understand, speaking in other tongues can just be speaking in the language. Can be just speaking or can be prophesying in tongues. Then you need an interpreter to interpret what the Spirit of God is saying. That I've also witnessed and I've seen it with my eyes, okay? Then now we have, we have now praying in tongues. Praying in the Spirit, okay? Which is the one that strengthens the believer, which is important for you as a child of God, okay? Tongues is an advantage of a believer. And I told you this, it is like you have a car, but you're saying, I'll walk to Mombasa because I don't need a car to get to Mombasa. It's true. You don't need a car to get to Mombasa, but it will take you less time and you will be less tired if you use the car. So it is the same way that the people who say, ah, me, I, you don't need tongues to get to heaven. Yes, you don't. Nobody will be stopped at the gates because you, you've not spoken in tongues, but you will get there tired. 
they will get there fatigued because there are dimensions of prayer you cannot touch because your boundaries are limited by praying in the in understanding so paul says i pray in understanding but i also pray in the spirit meaning that there are two different ways of of prayer you can pray in understanding with the things that you know the things that are within your cognitive abilities then you can pray in the spirit which one this one now is the boundaries of the spirit now the reason why a person who is praying in understanding will get tired before a person who is praying in the spirit gets tired is because your boundaries are the boundaries of what you know but the boundaries of a man who is praying in the spirit his boundaries are limitless okay so that one you pray for things that concern the spirit so you will take more, much more time there okay and then so now when you're praying you pray in understanding then you can pray in the spirit but there's another dimension now where the bible says that the spirit of god makes intercessions for us through groanings and yearnings that cannot be uttered now there's praying in the spirit and there's the spirit praying through you. This is a dimension where now you become a surrendered vessel to the Spirit of God. That the Spirit of God uses your body as a vessel to make intercessions. Are you getting that? Because remember, man ought always to pray. If we do not pray, heaven has no license to interfere. So what the Holy Spirit does is if you allow him if you allow him, if you release yourself to him, the Holy Spirit will begin to make intercessions for you in the Spirit now to begin to pray. Now, the prayers that you're making are not your own prayers. They are the prayers of the Spirit. When you're praying in the Spirit, is you, you know, you, you know what you're praying about. But when the Spirit is praying through you, the Spirit now brings up things for you to pray for, the things that would not even be within your environment. So you're praying, you find yourself praying for, for a country like Lithuania. Is that even a country? I don't know. Like you begin to pray for Lufthansa. You begin to pray for the most random things. You understand? Like you pray for your cousin in Sudan. You, you've not spoken for years. You've even forgotten about them. But the Spirit just gives you people to begin to pray for. Gives you issues to begin to pray for. Gives you something to pray. Now this one is the Spirit praying. But the one that the Bible says with groanings and yearnings that cannot be uttered. This one is not the oh, ah, that we do. Because we, we get there sometimes. It can get there. It can get there. But if I say oh, I've uttered. So that is not what the Spirit is talking about. The one that the Spirit is talking about is the one that cannot be uttered. Okay? So the Spirit is praying. This one now is not you. This one is simply, literally, a frequency that cannot be uttered by your speech. So, when you're walking in the room, someone can look at you and see that you're silent and them not know that there's intercession happening. So every day as you're walking, the Spirit is interceding, is making intercessions, is making intercessions. Now you have to be aware always that right now as I am walking, the Spirit of God is interceding for me. That thing changes your faith, changes how you look at life. Is that yes, I am praying in understanding, I am praying in the Spirit, but above that, there are other prayers that are rising up to heaven that are beyond my cognitive ability. The Spirit of God is making intercessions for me. I don't know who this is for, but I probably will delve into it much more uh, later because of time. I really wanted to keep this short because of time, and I pray that you guys are blessed. Let's go ahead and give, and let me encourage you and thank each and every one of you for partnering with us. Because of your partnership, we are able to do what we do every single day. And I thank you, especially the people who are abroad watching us and you guys send your support every single day. This is what keeps us going, guys. So continue supporting the work of the Lord. Continue being a blessing to us. And I'm sure that you're going to be blessed. God bless you so much. In Jesus' name, I pray. And I sense in the spirit, we need a camera, guys. We need uh, to buy cameras for Deeper Life. And this one, I want to put it as a project for Deeper Life, not for church members. If you would like to partner with us to buy these cameras, it will be amazing. The camera that I'm thinking of us buying is a cinema camera that can work both for Deeper Life and can work for if we ever needed to shoot music videos, if we need to shoot movies, if we need to shoot all these things, we can be able to get it. The camera is going for 630,000 Kenya shillings and I will share the details and I believe that we are going to do it just here on Deeper Life. And I don't know why I'm feeling in my spirit. Someone will be given that burden to buy that camera or to buy half or to buy the lens or something like that. And I believe that we are going to be blessed. God bless you as you go ahead and give. Go ahead and give and see you 
next week. God bless you.